Good day, folks. Welcome back to the channel. Underground Railroad Sketches. A collection of short stories about the slaves who actually used the Underground Railroad to escape to freedom. And the fact that someone was able to document this, absolutely great. The first story here tells a slave who had escaped. He comes across a barn, and he has no idea whether the person owning that is going to help him or turn him in. He is so frightened by the prospect that he'll be turned in. I think it would be completely fair to price it around. 1250. Good day, folks. Here are times when Pawn Stars came across some very tough items to sell. I'm a taxidermist, and I have a few items that were never picked up. Cut them and take their skin off, just like you would take your clothes off, only with a knife. This little guy? <laughs> Olivia, will you hand me that? <laughs> is that a deer's butt? It is. This is why I hate doing the night shift. But if it does sit around for a while, I can always use it to scare chum. I would like to get at least 400 for the turkey. 150 and you got a deal. Oh. World War II fighter plane. Corey and Rick head out to a hangar to check out the 1942 AT-6 Texan airplane that flew in World War II and the Korean War. The seller, a former Air Force pilot, tells Rick that Corey and all the American pilots in World War II were trained in such planes. Wow. This is cool. I bet I could do a pretty good job of crashing this thing. <laughs> the reason I want to sell this airplane is my wife and I would like to build a house. It flew in World War II and uh, the Korean War. It actually was a gunnery trainer. They actually had a gun mounted right here, and the pilots could actually fire the gun. This plane was used to train the best pilots in the world. So how much do you want for it, my man? $185,000. When Corey gets into the pilot seat, he can't help but smile and picture himself raining down hell on the Nazis. When the customer asks for $180,000, he decides to call in a Navy pilot to inspect it. I'm a Marine Corps F-18 pilot with 18 years of experience and former U.S. Navy Blue Angel pilot. He's got a clean cockpit set up. The thing to do here is to take this airplane flying. Yeah, let's take her up. Do your stuff. Where? I've inspected the exterior and the interior of the plane. We've looked at the log books. OK, you ready to go? Here we go, man. Now just stick in and get the leg in. I thought the aircraft performed very well on takeoff. We did a bunch of aerobatics. Oh my god. The aircraft flew pretty awesome. When the expert arrives, he informs Rick and Corey that it's not the best choice for anyone who's learning to fly. He proceeds to inspect the interior and exterior of the plane methodically before taking it out for a flight. After taking it to the skies, Rick and Corey watch enviously the expert and the seller perform awesome aerobatic moves, including loops and bell rolls. It's actually a lot better than I thought it was going to be. You know, I think it's fair value. It's about 170000 on the spot. So what does it cost to own one of these things? First thing is you need a hangar. That's about $300 a month. It needs to get lubricated oil through the systems. Everything's about $275 an hour to fly it. It's going to cost me a grand a month just to own until I can sell it. He values the plane at $170,000 and warns Rick, it will cost them $1,000 every month to maintain it in good working condition. I'd look at something around $165,000. Oh. You know, we sort of came out here on a whim. So on a whim, I'll give you hundred and forty grand. Yeah. It's getting warm. I mean, if I buy it off, it's going to sit around for a while. It's going to cost me money to own it until I resell it or figure out what the hell I'm going to do with it. There's so much heritage with this. 157. Kind of warm it up a little bit for you? No. I'd go like 140 on it if you, if you take it. You know, if you come up just a little bit. At 145, we'd be shaking hands. I'm going to go back and do a little bit more research. If I think we can pay, I'll give you a call and we'll do it. We were really close, so why don't we uh, just uh, think about that a little bit? Have a go with me. All right, thanks a lot, guys, for coming out. Unfortunately, Rick and Corey insist on paying the seller $140,000, but he digs his heel in at $145,000, so no deal is made. 1967 autographed Chicago Bears. Corey and Chum cannot hide their excitement when a customer brings in a 1967 autographed Chicago Bears football. The customer has a photo of one of the players giving his uncle the ball at a banquet. Corey is excited to revisit the days when pro football was not yet a billion dollar industry. Autographed Chicago Bears football. My uncle, it was given to him by Ronnie Bull, a Chicago player, at a banquet. You can see him handing it there. This is cool because it comes from a time when pro football was just starting to explode in popularity. This is the last year that George Hallis was a head coach. He was pretty much one of the guys that helped start the NFL into what it is, sure right? Was. Brian Piccolo's signature is pretty rare. Pair that with his friend Gail Sayers' signature, this thing could be worth a lot of money. Just from what I've seen on the internet, and what I put on it was $10,000. He goes through each of the signatures and speculates that the ball could be quite valuable if the signatures are authentic. 
When the customer asks for $10,000, Corey decides to call an expert to authenticate the ball. In condition signatures, we'd be talking several thousand dollars. We have to determine whether or not these are even authentic ones. These uh, signatures are very difficult to fake. And it's the same thing on Dick Butkus. I mean, his D almost looks like an N. A lot of people say, hey, who's this guy, Nick Butkus? Those signatures, they're 100% spot on, exactly what I want to see in a 1967 ball. In my opinion, these are clubhouse autographs. It still has authentic autographs. The expert shares a ton of information about the Chicago Bears and proceeds to inspect each of the signatures. Unfortunately, only two of the signatures are authentic. The rest are clubhouse signatures, which are worthless. When the expert estimates the ball's value at $1,000, the customer looks heartbroken. George Hallis and Dick Buckus, that's two solid Hall of Famers and are always gonna have value. You're looking at a maybe tops, thousand bucks. I got a feeling this is gonna sit around for years. I'd offer you around a hundred bucks for it. So I'll just keep holding on to it. Right on, man. Appreciate it. He decides to take the ball home after Corey offers him a measly $100. Underground Railroad Sketches When a customer offers Rick a signed first edition copy of Underground Railroad Sketches by E.M. Piet, his curiosity is piqued. He checks out the book while narrating well-known facts of the harrowing journey slaves and their conductors, the free people who risked their lives to help them, braved to get to freedom. Underground Railroad Sketches. A collection of short stories about the slaves who actually used the Underground Railroad to escape to freedom. The Underground Railroad was a really, really dangerous thing. Tens of thousands of people made it to safety, and the fact that someone was able to document this, absolutely great. I've been seeing prices in the range of $900 to $1,000. I'd like 700 bucks. The customer wants $700 for the book. Rick admits that the asking price is reasonable, but decides to call his rare book expert for an accurate evaluation. I see McKinstry signed it. It was McKinstry who pushed him and said, we need to have a record of what it was like for these slaves who were escaping. The first story here tells a slave who had escaped, he comes across a barn and he has no idea whether the person owning that is going to help him or turn him in. He is so frightened by the prospect that he'll be turned in. He doesn't blame the people either because they were gonna get a $500 reward for doing that. $500 at the time is huge. There aren't that many copies. It's it's very unusual book to see. It's not in horrible condition. Okay. I think it would be completely fair to price it around $1,250. When Rebecca arrives, she's excited to tell Rick and the customer more about how the book was written. She tells them that it is a documentary record of stories shared with the author by rescued slaves. Rebecca comments that the book is quite rare and is in decent condition. She values the book at $1,250 because of its rarity and historical significance. Can I give you 500 bucks? Books aren't like gold coins. They sit around for a while. You know, what she said, I'm thinking more like a thousand. You came in here, you only wanted 700. I thought it was a thousand dollar book. <laughs> How about 650? I'm thinking 800. I will give you your original asking price of 700 then. You know, 700 bucks sounds good. I only paid two bucks for it. <laughs> All right, good for you. Rick offers the customer $500 because the books are notoriously difficult to sell. Eventually, they agree on $700. Pablo Picasso Toro's Ceramic Plate. Rick is shown a Pablo Picasso Toro's Ceramic Plate. He admires the plate and immediately looks to strike a deal. A Picasso Maduro Ceramic, titled Toros. Everyone knows Picasso. I mean, he's like the most well-known artist in the world. Back then it was worth money, today it's worth a lot more. How much you want for this? 5,000. Um, there's a little chip in it. I mean, it's a slight, slight, slight damage on it, but it's a, probably a big deal. When the customer asks for $5,000, Rick points out that the plate is not in perfect condition. He's concerned that the little chip could reduce its value significantly. Picasso would have done the initial design on this, but he's not the one that painted it. The master painters would go back and paint it. Picasso, as you know, established styles that many, many, many artists now have, you know, they've, they've grown off of it. This is definitely authentic. There's no doubt about that. There's gonna be some variation in all of the painting. It looks like there's a chip. That's probably a firing chip. If it was a chip chip on the edge, you got a problem. It's really almost to be expected in a lot of these. 10 years ago, that's worth 1,800 bucks. Now this will consistently sell for about 4,500. Chad, the art expert, confirms the plate is authentic. He tells Rick that the plate isn't considered chipped because a lot of plates have similar firing chips. Rick offers the customer $2,000 and he tries to get 4,000. 5,000. Not gonna happen. I would give you like two grand for it. I don't think I can take less than four. I'll make it plain and simple. I'll give you 2,500 bucks. I'm not gonna go anymore. It's art. It can sit around for a while. I don't think I can make that work. 
Well, thanks for coming in, then. Thanks for having um, me. I appreciate it. Change your mind. Always come back. Even after Rick increases the offer to 2500 the customer opts to hold onto the plate and sell it down the road. Taxidermy items. Olivia calls for Corey's help when a customer brings in some creepy taxidermy animals during the night shift. The cheery lady shows them three taxidermy items, but Chum and Olivia are more interested in her creepy profession than the items she has for sale. I'm a taxidermist. And I have a few items that were never picked up. I need to sell these because I need the room in my house and my shop. Cut them and take their skin off, just like you would take your clothes off, only with a knife. Kind of creepy to me, but a lot of people are really into it. This is a real grand turkey. What's on the inside of them? It's just the body. Then there's wires that go through their wings, through their legs. Corey is hesitant to deal with the lady because taxidermy items are not only difficult to sell, they make some customers very uncomfortable when they're put on display. She shows them a stuffed turkey, an African Plains red heart beast, and the creepiest of all deer's butt that has been customized into a nightmarish creature. This little guy? <laughs> Olivia, will you hand me that? <laughs> is that a deer's butt? It is. If you look at it this way, I used a bobcat jaw set, then I hand sculpted a nose onto it to look like a dog's nose. And those are some eyes that I collect from different taxidermy conventions I go to. This is why I hate doing the night shift, but if it does sit around for a while, I can always use it to scare chum. I would like to get at least 400 for the turkey. Uh, what about the moose thing? I'd like six and a quarter. The lady asks for $1,250 for the three items. Corey offers her $100 for the creepy deer butt. This thing right here, $250. i am really only interested in the butt head. I ran into a problem before having this stuff where people wouldn't even come in my store because of the taxidermy stuff. I'll give you 100 bucks for it. No, how about 230 There's a lot of work that goes into that. Uh, 150 and you got a deal. That's the most I'm going to pay. Oh, OK. Deal? All right. After some negotiation, the lady hesitantly pats with the butt head for $150. Cigar box labels. Rick and the old man check out some vintage cigar box labels a customer picked up for $3 at a garage sale. Rick admires the condition of the cigar box labels and preaches about the long lost days when cigar manufacturers competed fiercely for the largest market share. I have these cigar box labels. Saw a couple presidents on there. Back then, they had to find something to get their name out there. They didn't have no tweeter. You mean Twitter? <laughs> there was a lot of competition. They were constantly changing the name of their cigars just so they could put new artwork on there and make it a little different. Back then, everyone smoked. After Rick finishes reminiscing, he comments on the high quality art and explains to the bored customer how it was made using stone lithography and gold leafing. They're all in remarkably good shape. They started adding gold leafing. The process to do it was expensive. The artwork on these things is something that's really, really collectible. So how much are we looking to get at them? How about 300? <laughs> they don't go for a lot of money and they sit around for a long time. I'll give you 50 bucks. I need a little bit more, man. He's shocked when the customer asks for $300 for the set and offers him $50 instead. $200. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 100 bucks. That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. I'll do it. The customer accepts Rick's second offer of $100. Antique cocktail mixer. Rick and the old man check out a Prohibition era cocktail shaker. The old man is shocked that anyone would need such a contraption to pour a simple drink. Rick tells them that when the prohibition kicked in in 1917, high quality alcohol was too expensive because it had to be smuggled into the country. What do we have here? <laughs> it's an old mixer. It's probably from the 20s. The alcohol tasted so nasty, they had to mix it with anything so they can get it down their throat. You can mix a lot of things in it. I mean, put concrete in it, you can make cement. Most people were reduced to drinking homemade bathtub gin that tasted terrible. So terrible that people begin mixing it with all sorts of things to help it go down the throat. But this thing is more of a curiosity than a vintage collectible. I like it, but I can't pay a lot for it. How much you want for it? 350? Hell no. I mean, I might consider it if the thing looks semi-new, but it looks terrible. You know, it's 90 years old, it really works well. Things like this have a tendency to sit. It's gonna be a tough sell. Unfortunately, the mixer is not in good shape and is missing some of its original parts. Rick offers him $100 for the machine, to which the old man offers him $75. You know, I'll give you 100 bucks for the thing. 125? 75. He's just mean and grumpy. 
Yeah, I'll do 125. More than I was expecting to get, so I'm real happy. Rick apologizes to his grumpy old dad and offers the customer $125. This is where we'll end our video. We hope you enjoyed watching. Make sure to comment, hit the like and subscribe buttons, hit that notification bell for more videos like this, and share this video with your family and your friends. See you soon.